I think we are good to go, fellas. And here we go. Yes, we are. Alan, we've hey. done it. Three. We finally got the last member of the Holy Triumvirate, or should I say Triumphirate. <laughs> oh, very Mr. Nice. Mike Levine himself. <laughs> no. Hot. It's going to be a hot time in the city tonight with the mic on the show. So uh, very excited. Very excited. Same here. So Gilmore and the best for last. We had Gilmore, Rick Emmett, and now, of course, the best for last, Mike Levine. But don't tell the other guys I said that. No, I'm glad you said it that way. (laughs) They warned us that you might be the hardest guy to get in touch with. (laughs) All right. Good news. Good news. Yeah, great news. Allied Forces, which was originally released... In 1981, it was your fifth studio album. Well, here we go. For Record Store Day, June 12th and June 17th, this will be the reissue of the Allied Forces box set, the 40th anniversary on Road, sorry, Round Hill Records. Excuse me. Very exciting. Very exciting. Alan, what do you want to ask about? What do you want to ask him Here's my original copy. Hold on a second. There it is. There's my original copy right here. Attic Records. (laughs) Attic Records. (laughs) Here's, here's my new copy. Yeah, that's oh, what I want to see. That's yeah. what I want to see. That's what I, you know what's funny? You know what's funny? I opened this up today and it was Sesame Street, the album inside. <laughs> <laughs> I go, where did that come from? All right. So there's some Sesame Street album with with Triumph. There you go. It's nice. It's reminds me of the old stickball story. What what part of town is quick, Mike? What part of town is this uh, sculpture here? It's in uh, That's downtown? That's down by, by the Canadian National Exhibition, the CNE, down by the Lakeshore. Okay. All right. Hey, and I'm dressed like this because you're the guy who's supposed to wear all the hockey jerseys. How come Rick Scott is on there? Well, that was before. <laughs> I, is, is Rick still a Canadians fan? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I'll have to ask him. I, I think it was just an outfit because he was trying to – you know, I think we tossed for it. I either was going to wear a jersey or he was going to wear a jersey. So. <laughs> I mean, do you still have all those jerseys? Like, no matter where you were, you always had a home team's jersey on. Um, we we sold some at the Triumph fan event um, for charity. Wow. Um, back in uh, when the for the documentary that was a couple of years ago, I guess, and uh, I donated some to the Hard Rock as well. So I think I have like two left. Wow. So this, you know, my first Triumph album, April 1st, 1983, Sam the Record Man walked in. I don't know if they were clearing this out because it was on Attic or not, but one of the best buys I ever made. And what an album to be introduced to the band. I, I mean, you know, seven songs, two instrumentals. Who can get away with that today? Well, that's the other, that's when there was vinyl and sounding good, you know? Yeah. Can you can you show us the box set to show everybody what it looks like? Yeah, that's what I showed you. That was the, the, the cover of the box. What does it weigh? About 10 pounds with all the stuff oh, you have inside? Oh, man, it's, it's unbelievable. I can hardly lift it. Do, do, you, do you want to give a rundown of what's in there, or do you want us? There is. There's so much stuff, I can't remember what's in there, so but I'll tell stuff. you. I, I, I'm going to go by memory here. Okay. <laughs> I just got this the other day. It just got shipped to me because it's wow. finally finished. So June twelfth. Yeah, it was, it was a record store day. It was quasi exclusive in Canada, in the U.S., and Europe. Um, inside, you will have a Allied Forces picture disc mm-hmm. of the original album, um, which is really cool. It's got a cutout so the label shows through, and there are the, the disc shows through. Uh, there is a uh, double live uh, gatefold album with Triumph in Cleveland on the uh, from the Allied Forces tour. Uh, there is a, a vintage uh, replica, of, it's the same book, of the, the Allied Forces tour book. There's also a beautiful, um, uh, huge kind of thing, program thing of, of the band. There's an essay in there going by song, song by song with quotes from Rick Gill and Mike individually on each song. Uh, you know, vintage pictures, uh, all kinds of neat stuff in that. There's a tour pass from the Allied Forces tour. There is, uh, what else? Rick used to do a, uh, as you guys may remember, uh, I, re- I don't know if you're old enough or not, but he used to do a, a color a cartoon feature in his Parader magazine. Oh, uh, that takes me back. Called, called Rock Tunes. So there's, he, he had three 
uh, uh, cartoons from that era that never got published by Hit Parader. So they're in there. Okay. There's uh, handwritten lyrics uh, for three songs. There's a single, a vinyl single from, uh, there's uh, Allied Forces come from our upcoming release in the fall or late fall for early next year. I'm not sure yet, but it's a tribute album. And so there's Allied Forces, which is completed with a, um, I guess, all, all guest musicians, all LA based. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what's on the, the other side? Magic Power from a show we did in Ottawa that's never been released before from yeah. the yeah. Allied Forces tour. And uh, I think that's it, but I don't even miss it. Anyway. It doesn't matter. It's really cool. You know, just, you know, the Triumph fans, I think, will just salivate over everything. The, the live in Cleveland, right? That's from the King Biscuit Hour. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's true. That was originally a radio show. That was a, and they, re, they remastered that from what I'm reading here. Yeah. Uh, I've heard it. And yeah, I'd love to have that remastered vinyl edition of that. That'd be really cool. Yeah, it sounds really hot. It's really hot. I, you know, we, it was hard, barely touched. It was really well recorded. The band played really well. Um, I'm, I'm extremely proud of, of, of the way it turned out. I couldn't believe how much Gil sounded like Ted Nugent when he when Drew, oh, me you know, too. listened yes, to that album. It's true. It's true. He's like rambling on. I'm like, what is this? The the, the Nuge? <laughs> I don't remember. I saw you guys a couple of times at concert. I don't. I must have been. I took a bathroom break or something when that was happening. No, it, was bad, that. it was it was the bad drugs you were taking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too young for that. <laughs> You're never too young to take bad drugs. But, you know, and again, the, you know, Blinding Light show, that was always a highlight for me. Each and every concert you guys did, that was really a, a highlight for me. And, it, and it's included on this live album. So. Yep. Yeah, it's got, a, it's, it's, it's got a good set of tunes on it. So, uh, you know, it's a, again, it's a double album, gatefold, and, you know, neat pictures inside, 180 gram vinyl. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really a nice piece. So it's everything Allied Forces. And, and kudos. To, oh, sorry, Jim. Uh, I'm just going to do a kudos here to Andy Curran, uh, yeah. of course, of Coney Hatch. Uh, you know, he was the project manager and he put this all together. So a big plug to him, who's a friend of the show here. Uh, great job, Andy. Go ahead, Alan. And, and Andy's spectacular. He got really dirty and dusty doing this. Like he crawled up in the attic above Metal Works and was rolling around up there finding stuff. It, it, it <laughs> found so much great stuff. It was unbelievable. Stuff we didn't even know we had, he found. <laughs> wow. <laughs> No, but take us back to the time, Mike. Uh, you know, you, the progressions of power albums over. Now you're, you're going into metal work studio, right? Is this like one of the first recordings in the studio? Yeah, we were the second band to go in the studio, um, even though it was ours. But Doug and the Slugs did oh, yeah, their, I that. one of their albums in there, which turned out to be their biggest album. <laughs> so, so they were like experimental. So we found out what worked and what didn't work, what needed to get fixed and all that. So, uh, yeah, but we were album two. Wow. And what did it mean to have your own studio? Was that a comfort or was that a hindrance in the sense that, oh, you know, now we're getting a little too, I don't know, I guess com- it happens. I remember the Tragically Hip, you know, they, they they started recording in their own studio and then they became sort of, I don't know if the word is complacent, like there's no deadline so they could never finish the project. Did you have a little bit of that when you first had your own studio? Um not really. What it did do, though, it allowed us to take our time, for sure, because, you know, every album has a budget. So when you have your own studio, the biggest cost in it, making an album was the recording studio. So when you have your own studio, we went, okay, we can go over budget and it doesn't cost us anything. <laughs> so we weren't too worried about the clock, which okay. is always a, a good thing, because when you, the clock's thick and you settle for things that maybe you shouldn't know. Um, you settle for things anyway. No one's ever 100% happy when an album's done. But just the comfort zone uh, was incredible because we could relax and not sweat it out. We'd rehearse. We could take a song and, and spend eight hours on it and go, you know what, and go back in the control room and listen to it and go, ah, that's no good. You know, it's out. It's just erasing. It stinks. So you could do that and go, you know, hey, no big deal. We just need another tune. So, uh, you know, having, having their studio was like incredible. It just, it just made all the difference. I think you can tell by the album. You know, that speaks for itself. I mean, and, and, a big, and a big plug to Metalwork Studio, which is, I guess, that in Le Studio, but it's the last studio standing, the greatest studio in Canadian history. 
you know, I mean, just think of Guns N' Roses and you guys have a long list of, of, of uh, you know, achievements at that studio. It's just a triumph albums. And I don't have a list in front of me, but I know it's long. <laughs> well, it's you know, everything from Prince to uh, Bruce Springsteen was in there. Drake did his first records there for the first three or four records. Uh, you know, just the, the, the list keeps going. You know, okay. the yeah. soundtrack for that, uh, for the, uh, uh, the movie Chicago. Mm-hmm. You know, with uh, oh. all those people that couldn't sing at it, you know, it was, it was done there. <laughs> but there was a vocal coach to help them, you know. So they all hung out for weeks and weeks. And it's just, it was it, the, the list, you know, it's like 10 pages of, of a, a major league artists that passed through the studio over the years. It's nice to hear. And I don't, I don't know, there's something about this album, I just love listening to it in the summertime much more than the wintertime. I don't know if it's just the power or it's, it's one of those you know a beautiful sunny day you just want to open all the windows in the house and crank it up to 11 you know and i want to turn my air conditioning on alan and put it to 11 <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> you got fool for your love which you know again gill's voice i i, I could only appreciate it now at the time i was more of a rick guy but man like we brought up with our interview with him looking back and re-listening to all the albums he had a great voice Absolutely, you know, and that was great for the band because we, we had two great singers in the band. So it, was, it, it gave a, a whole different kind of perspective instead of the same voice all the time, ripping your head off, uh, you had two voices ripping your head off. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Magic Power, is that is that one of the largest, that your, your, your biggest hits in the U.S.? Would, would, be, would it be Magic Power? Oh uh, yeah, you know what? Um, I you know I I would say "Lay It on the Line" is the yeah. was the, was the the, the number that, that's the song that really broke us at album radio in the United States uh, in 1979. It was everywhere. You you mm-hmm. couldn't find you you got sick of it. It was played uh, 120 or 130 rock rock radio stations uh, countrywide in America like 18 times a day. Wow! Uh, so it was uh, you know that song is still constant yeah and, you know i say magic power could it could be number two Bob, 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 Bob. yeah yeah fight the good fight uh yeah. you know it's uh it's amazing like every time i get in my car which isn't very often these days <laughs> and i yeah. turn on the radio between q107 here and boom uh i hear triumph it's unbelievable yeah. you know and i got a new car so you know i've tested out the stereo see if it still holds water <laughs> That was really fucking great. <laughs> and then Allied yeah. Forces. I mean, I, I, that song I, 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 just rips your head off. Oh right? yeah, doesn't it? Killer, yeah, yeah, killer. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I got I got to look at the the tracks again. I mean, oh, Allied Forces. You know, what a way to start off the album. Of course, the Air Raid Siren, siren right at the beginning. And f- why? Like, there's a question here from a fan, and they're saying, "Why was Ordinary Man never played live?" Um, that's a good question. Well, it was either that or Blinding Light Show because those two songs are long and down tempo. Yeah. And we were an energy band. So, you know, it was, and, and quite honestly, Blinding Light Show had, you know, a lot of up tempo stuff in it. And it, was, yeah. it got really heavy. Great and, song. and it was a classic triumph song, you know. So, uh, Ordinary Men did very well, you know, radio wise and fan wise and all that. But it was just, uh, from from a, uh, a straight concert point of view and keeping the show moving along and pacing and all that, it just didn't didn't fit. And what about the orchestration? Like a big chorus. There's a lot of a lot of vocals going on there. Were you, were you part of that? Me? No, yeah. they wouldn't let me sing. They would let. <laughs> Stand in the back. We'll get the rest of the guys. Uh, even even live, you know, our our friend of house mixer, Harry Witz, you know, would come to me after a show. The boys. The boys asked me to, to, to leave your you leave your microphone in the monitors, but oh, turn it they're, off. They're, you're singing, and they just turn you off. <laughs> That's right. I could hear myself, but nobody else can. <laughs> Hot time in the city tonight. That's just pure rock and roll. You swear that came out of the 1950s, right? Yeah, that's like a Chuck Berry kind of thing. You know, we didn't really rip Chuck off, but um, it's uh, you know it's just a straight ahead rock and roll boogie. Away you go. You know, rock. You know, high energy all the way. How did the songs? Okay, you could tell like when there's a vocal by Rick. Was that was he the guy who started that, that seed, that first idea, and then the whole the rest of the band worked on the song? How, how did the the songwriting process for the album go? You know, it depends. Sometimes it was uh, you know Rick would come in and he'd have a completed song, pretty yeah. much. 
you know, okay. but then it had to, we had to take it from an acoustic guitar to voice and make it a triumph song. And so, you know, a lot of changes went on sometimes on those kinds of things. And other, so other times Gil and Rick would sit there and, and hash away on something and figure out some, uh, like, Fool for Your Love, the, you know, the, the, the head, the opening guitars and stuff. You know, Gil would say them to Rick that Rick would play them. And he goes, no, that's not it. That's not it. But, you know, try moving your hands here. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> so there was a lot of in interpersonal relationships, so to speak, going on. Then I come in, I go, I go guys, you know, you were way off base here. You know, what you think song needs is this, this, and this. So, you know, there was collaborative efforts. Uh, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it wasn't so much on the collaborative end. When we interviewed Rick, I think he was all nervous because the name of the show is The Metal Voice. So he, he got all nervous. and, and But he, he did, like the song, The Petit de Chud, you know, he was really thankful that you guys, you and Gil, gave him the space to, what he said, to explore his little side trips, you know, and to do these types of classical pieces or blues pieces like Suitcase Blues. Uh, he was very appreciative of that. And, and so, you know, did you always find that was like a, a maybe a highlight or just something that was interesting, uh, his little acoustic pieces that maybe wasn't being done from other bands? Well, it was it was unique for a rock band, a heavy rock band, uh, uh, to to have an acoustic piece, either live or or in the studio on an album. And uh, it, it it's like a, an ear break almost. It just changes everything. You go... You know, you, you come out of a heavy duty ending on a, on a song and all of a sudden you got twiddly twiddly going on, nice and quiet and peaceful. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, it was neat, you know, and it was great live when we did a, when, you know, we just, you know, everything cooled down, Rick would go out to school, lasers on him, you know, a little smoke. He'd just sit there and play and you could hear a pin drop in a, you know, 18,000 seat arena. And people would pay attention because, you know, that, you know, that was on the record too. It wasn't just, we're trying to fill space or anything. You know, Mike, that's what a lot of sort of the young folks who are Triumph fans today, they don't they don't know about that Triumph went out and headlined what almost all the time it almost small, medium or large shows. They were you guys were always headliners. Yeah, except for can some you, outdoor, you know, select outdoor shows, obviously. You know, can, can you speak to that a little bit? That that sort of mentality, we're gonna headline and that's it. Yeah, well, we made that decision. You know, we had we, you know, we were able to do it because we we're stupid, and head, you know, and headstrong, and we don't care. Uh, you know, I don't care what people, we didn't care what people said. You know, <laughs> oh, you can't get across the border to play in the states unless you do this, do that. Oh, yeah, 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 right. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have used to have a saying. You know, if you open the door a little crack, we'll drive two semis right through it and bust it down. <laughs> But we were lucky. We, we owned our own sound and lights. So we were able to um, go and play without having that expense uh, um, on top of, uh, you know, everything else that you you got to pay for in your road crew, your trucks and all that. But uh, having the sound of lights enable us to headline. That's an incredible <laughs> story. That's just an incredible story. Like, I mean, I've seen you, of course, at concerts. You, I mean, you played the Montreal Forum. I think it was the Montreal Forum. Yeah, it probably was. And I think Helix opened up on Never Surrender, and what a show and what a package! Yeah. Um, and and again, sports. you guys were the first to have that major stage production. I guess I guess of course Kiss had that too, right? But you always went out big, right? Yeah, it's you know, bet them bigger, sleep in the streets. We always say, but <laughs> <laughs> it's bigger the better. You know, it's like no holds barred. When we had some extra money, we buy more stuff. You know, it's like, okay, we've got an extra $10,000 sitting here. What are we going to do with it? You know, do we buy, you know, do we get lasers? Do we, uh, you know, have three more flash pots? <laughs> if we a little talking pot. head during the Thunder 7 tour, you know? Yeah, laser that, head. yeah, that whole thing, you know? It's like, you know, what do we do with the money? Because all the money went, went back in the show, you know, wow. period. So that's, uh, you know, we had a, an eight-truck production that we fit into four trucks. And that was, you know, that, that helped too, you know, because Gil was really great at putting that stuff together and working with the lighting designers and the uh, the trucking companies and figuring out, uh, you know, how to how to fit everything in. Because, you know, half the time, you know, we'd go to bed, like we, a lot of friends at Maple Leaf Gardens and, uh, uh, you know, so I'd go down sometimes early in the day and watch, and watch the trucks unload, you know, for my favorite bands and that and, and get to hang out. And, uh, you know, I, I watched all these trucks back in and they were only half full. <laughs> <Quite> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, well, it's like they come out, the trucks, 10 minutes later, it's empty, and when the next one backs in, they got 30 trucks coming in. You could have done this with four trucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting around there. Like, those are probably the same bands that say, let's just rent studio space, and we'll just write inside the studio, you know? Well, we yeah, don't we don't go in with anything. Yeah, you know, they, they, you know, a lot of bands just had managers. The managers get paid on, the, you know, on your gross earnings, not on your net, so the manager would, you know, would do would spend all their money for them and then they, they go where's all the money oh you had 18 trucks yeah <laughs> well, do we need 18 trucks the manager goes i don't know <laughs> but you did you know that that just just blows my mind about triumph you guys were efficient the model that people are using today is efficiency right because uh -huh. nothing is no, nothing's full blown nobody could afford it but you guys were doing that efficiency model back then which which just blows my mind and you know what kudos to you uh, Mike, because you're sort of like the unsung hero. Like you got Gil and Rick fighting for that spotlight, but you're the guy holding it all together as the producer, right? Yeah. As 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 the backbone. So I mean, tell us about your pro you producing Triumph over the years. Well, I would say you know somebody had to do it. I I had some experience when the band started. I was really the only guy that had spent a considerable amount of time in recording studios at that point, either in, in bands, really a long time before Triumph, or, uh, you know, I worked for a record label and, uh, you know, spent a lot of time in the studio with some really heavy duty people in New York and learned a lot, you know? It's, it's I, you know, I, I'd like a sponge, like learning is the key, you know, and you listen to what people have to say when they're, when they've, you know, groveled their way from the bottom to the top and meeting some of these guys that, you know, the greatest songwriters in the world, and, uh, so the greatest engineers and stuff, you know, it was like mind blowing. We just sit and talk to them and they share their experiences. And, you know, they ask me questions, they give you real answers. So um, I learned by watching how uh, good producers would handle uh, musicians on the floor and handle engineers in the control room and just make things happen, keep things flowing, and, and put a stop to things when they're getting out of control. So I was, you know, I was lucky enough to have that experience, and I certainly learned a whole lot more with Triumph because uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, we spent way more hours probably on the first two albums that I had ever had in the studio combined. So <laughs> it was, uh, uh, it was everything was a learning experience, and we, you know, everybody contributed. But the good news is that somebody always has to have a final say, and that always fell to me. Right. say okay yeah that's fun let's put it to bed rick you can't put any more guitars on it rick that solo is fantastic no we don't need any more guitars rick Gil, we don't need to try any more vocals it's perfect the way it is i love it no you can't sing it again go on to the next one someone's <laughs> got to put the hammer down <laughs> somebody's got to be the butt. but every, every album was when it came time to for mastering which you know we had deadlines we had release dates when we we're getting close to getting finished, the record company had called from New York and say, when, you know, we need a release date. We have to set it up. Said, okay. And I said, give me the delivery dates you need to have the, the masters and the lacquers and the, you know, to go to the pressing plants and the stampers and all that stuff. I get a date and I have to live with it. So more times than not, I'd be up at getting on a plane to New York at like six in the morning. <laughs> because by midnight, the stampers, the mastering had to be done. The lacquer sent over to the place that was making the stampers, and then it had to go into the pressing plant. Yeah. So cool. it was, uh, uh, that was not fun. <laughs> <That's>, it's, <laughs> again, it's, it's like you had to mix, and the mixing, you know, was like very, very special time. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and that, but the mastering, you know, I got to work with the greatest mastering engineer in the world, Bob Ludwig, for her many yeah. for, Aldenova, Aldenova keeps telling me. <laughs> yeah, you know, Bob was the greatest. He never worked past five o'clock, but for me, he'd stay until it was done. Oh <laughs> was, wow! Yeah, yeah he's he was great. He's definitely amazing. Yes, because I, I, I bring him two twenty twos. He needed. He needed after you couldn't buy him because they had coding in him. You couldn't buy him in America. So. <laughs> you you could only buy Canada. coding in, in in Canada. Is that it over there? Uh, yeah, those, you know, the 220, you know, whatever, I can't remember. They call it AC and C now or something. Yeah, no, I remember, I remember, I remember. Um, uh, okay, so I, I know there's, okay, there's a documentary that everybody knows about that it's going to be coming out soon. But what about this tribute album? Are you allowed to speak to that? Um, I can only speak a bit because it's still in production. But uh, Mike Clank, 
Guns N' Roses, uh, yeah. first album, uh, Motley Crue, White Snake. Uh, you know, you can find Clint's name on a million at Triumph. You can find his name on a lot of albums. So uh, we were talking with him because we, we, you know, we talked pretty steadily over the years, and and we were talking about maybe doing a tribute album. So. Uh, Clint, you can produce it, but you know you, you're the guy that's got to wrangle all the uh, all the tributees. You know it's not going to be our job to do that. And, and the record company bought it and gave us a budget to do it. So Clint's been slowly, you know, amassing the talent and doing the getting the tracks done. So again, it's been recorded in LA. There's, there's going to be some great guest artists on it. You have great musicians. That's like that. It's going to be a really cool project when it's done. Do, do is, there time, is there a timeline for it? Is there like? Oh, well, release? the record company wants it yesterday, but that's not happening. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, wait, everything wait, wait. like like everything got delayed with COVID. You know, you yes. couldn't get people to go. The studios were shut down for two months in LA. I mean, nobody yeah. even after that didn't want to go in a studio unless they, you know, you know. But we kind of put the parameters on that everything, you know, social distance, no more, no more people that had to be. In the, in the entire complex would be there, you know, so we're able to assure the, the guest artists that, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was COVID safe. Yeah, yeah. And the Strongs are so, so, always so strong with Triumph. They're, I mean, we can't wait to hear this album because this, you know, when you got a strong song, anybody can do it, right? Yeah, we do, you know, our, our only parameter from a band point of view is don't do it like we did it. Do your own take on it. We don't want to hear somebody just copy what we did. We might as well just send you the bed tracks and put a vocal on it. <laughs> kind of thing. You know, we want an interpretation would be great. Yeah. And and a lot of a lot of the money that should have made money is going to uh, a charity called Music Cares in, in the good. States. Um it's it's a huge, huge organization that supports uh, you know, artists in trouble and uh, uh you know everything for it's it's kind of like a charity we have here called Unison. That is, you know, supports industry people that are on hard, having a hard time. That's good. And like especially now, you know, everybody from a roadie to a record company guy or an ex-record company guy, publisher, not working, all that. So it's the, uh, you know, we were help raise money for for those and that and that and then, uh, um, and then in the states, it's music carry. The biggest question that's asked by Triumph, and it's nonstop, you probably get asked every day, we ask Rick, we ask Gil, why, let's just clear this up now, the reunion, why is the band not going to be playing any more live gigs? I mean, what, what did my partner say? I don't remember, but Talk I, to I you. guess. They, they... Come on, you don't remember. Boom. Talk to Mike. I, I call bullshit on that one. <laughs> well, I, I think, I, I, and again, from memory, because it's a few months back, I think what they told us was, it's just, you know, it, it we're just doing other stuff now. And it was just sort of left at that. We're just going to be pursuing other avenues. We just don't want to play live anymore. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. You know what? I, I think we're, we're um, uh, you know, when we got back together in 2008 and did the, the Sweden Rock Festival and the Rocklahoma thing, uh, there was a tour planned around after that. Because we, we, the three of us figured, you know what, we get, get in the line, we're laughing, uh, you know, we're playing good, uh, you know, let's think about a tour. So, you know, basically promoters and agents went to work and had dates booked uh, across Canada and uh, a ton of the, America. Then the recession hit and it was bad news, you know, it's, we just went, uh-uh, this is like uh, two views. It was high risk. A lot of acts just canceled tours and we were one of them. Although we hadn't got to the point where tickets were on sale or any announcements, but we had talked about doing it and we were ready to go. But uh, after that, you know, it took three years, four years, and then for the industry to really come back where we, we would have felt comfortable. And by then, it was, you know, kind of the, the shine had worn off the anticipation <laughs> of doing that because it's a huge commitment of time and, and money too. Uh, to, to to stage that it would have you know taken it basically a year year and a half out of our lives and over the years everybody was doing something different you know so uh to, to commit that amount of time to a triumph tour at that stage in 2008 yeah we were we were hot and happy and we were into it you know we had the energy enthusiasm you know three four five years later 2013 14 it was like uh, -uh can't, can't really do that you know? just a, not a great idea 
Yeah, yeah Rick, in our interview with him, was he was basically retiring from the from the road. And uh, he, he, he teased, I think, us a little bit about maybe when this documentary come out, there might be something happening. And Yeah, maybe, uh, you know, it's like, but it won't be anything that that is will be expensive, so to speak. You know, never say never, right? That's right. I was, that's, <laughs> that's a good quote. <laughs> Très à propos, as we say here in Quebec. So to speak, yeah. As we once wrote. <laughs> as we once wrote. But, you know, going back to the live album, listening to it, I mean, anybody that knows me, I could talk about Rick Emmett's guitar playing and his vocals all day long. But uh, Gil, I mean, he's singing, and he's not just playing a Charlie Watt beat. This guy's all over the drum set. It just, and it's amazing to hear everything, the fills that are going on while he's pitch perfect. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, not an easy job to do, but he took it on and uh, did, it was great at it. You know, it's, that's, a, that's tough. I don't know how he did it. Thank, thank God I didn't have to sing. That's all I know. <laughs> what about, okay, so what about the documentary? Where does that stand? I know that's been, of course, of COVID, it's been pushed back. I mean, is there any news now? Uh, we're, it's getting close to actually being, it's just in the final stages. We just approved all the, uh, the, the credits at the, on, the, um, on the exit from the film itself, uh, you know, for, for the songwriting and you know, who, who's, who's what and who's special thanks and who's courtesy of and all that stuff. And I was in the studio with uh, Sam Dunn, the director, and Mark Riccadelli, the editor uh, in downtown Toronto, about, a, I'd say, three weeks ago. Oh, and we uh, ran through the audio, all the audio uh, corrections, and you know, just you know, move it up here, down there. You know, something should come up there. And then they threw, you know, when I signed off and said, "I think it's great," I only got three comments. They, they wrote them down, and said, "Now get out. We have work to do." <laughs> so, but uh, right now, it's just a matter of, I guess, um, laying all that into the final cut of the film. And uh, once that's done, it's like, let's print it, boys. It's finished. So I say, you know, a couple of weeks, it'll be, it'll, it should be done three weeks. I'm really excited about that. Oh, very yeah. excited. And then we'll see where it goes. You know? So yeah. once you got to finish work, then it's a matter of, okay, what are we going to do with it? Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a sensational film, by the way. It is sensational. Well, we yeah. can't wait to see it. And, it, it uh, you know what? triumph has been it's sort of like because you're not out there touring all the time it's become you guys have sort of become bigger in a sense right because of that sort of scarcity that that not being out on the road people are just catching on to the music generation after generation and there's just this demand i'm pretty sure that you get the demand is really high today Oh, that'd be cool. I, I like live. There's someone hammering at my window here. So I'm going yeah, yeah, to okay. exit for a second. It's all right. Don't worry. Take your time. <laughs> Take your time. We're used to this by now. <laughs> we get pee break solid. We get everything. Oh, here. yeah. That was that. That was the. Uh, who was that? Oh, yeah. That was uh, Max Norman. Yeah. yeah. yeah just a couple of He's kids. He's back. Or something. It's all good, Mike. It's all, all right. good. It's all good. I was. So, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, I was going to talk about uh, Wheel of Fortune. What about it? <laughs> I just, it just, somebody wrote a comment and they go, Mike was on Wheel of Fortune in the 90s. And I'm like, what? And then I remembered you were. I don't yeah. know. Just, yeah, just, you just, could just, tell Pat Sajic was a huge Triumph fan. <laughs> oh, yeah. I never registered, right? I, I'm only in Triumph. Yeah, I wasn't right. supposed to say that. That's why. Oh, okay. Really? Yeah. You're supposed to do it low key. I I'm going to kill these kids. Give me a second. I, yeah, I, no, it's I, all good. Like, Don't worry about it. Guys, they have now, okay? I'm on the phone. You want a newspaper subscription? We're here selling Girl Guide cookies. <laughs> this is, doesn't get more live than this, Alan. This is live on the Metal Voice with Mike Levine. And renovations. <laughs> and renovations. They're asking, I'll look at some questions here. Will it be on any streaming services? And I don't think they're ready to answer that yet. It, so so you sure. weren't supposed to bring up Triumph on Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, you're not allowed to say where you work or what you do. You know, you can say I'm a, I'm a consultant or I'm a, I'm oh, a really? computer engineer, but you can't say I work for Intel or something like that. No, no plugs are allowed. <laughs> I watched it and I could see that, oh, you work for a band. You're part of some, that's how he, he sort of, he, he, he yeah. led the question, right? 
You're yeah. part of some sort of band, Not right? just any band. Try it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what was that experience like anyways? Uh, it was it was uh, weird. Because <laughs> you had to earn your way on the show. It was, um, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll try and keep this relatively concise. <laughs> but when we were on the road, uh, between six and seven o'clock, or sorry, or seven and eight, I guess. Yeah, between seven and eight o'clock East Coast time. Uh, was my time to rest before because I was the guy that ended up doing the radio stuff, you know, day of show, you know, go from sound check to radio or radio to sound check back to radio and then end up at the hotel. And I just went down to clear my, clear my brain out. And so I'd watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just got to be it because it just took your mind to a different place. So well, I guess after my son was, uh, I don't know how old, probably nine or 10 years old, I would always tell him, you know, when you want to do something, uh, you, you put your mind to it and you can do it. And he goes, well, we're well, really good at Wheel of Fortune. Why don't you, why don't you go on Wheel of Fortune? <laughs> and I said, that's too hard to do. I don't even know how to even begin. <laughs> and he said, well, you just, you just said, why don't you try? <laughs> so. We figured out that I, I, you know, we kind of slid, slid me into an audition through a friend at CTV that my wife knew. And, but you had to go through the whole process with, it was an amazing process, how they do it and select the contestants. But, you know, I made the final cut and then they called me and said, you know, we are doing the Christmas show in November or whatever it was and uh, you'd be here. Kind of thing. And I said, what, are you going to send me the plane ticket? What hotel? No, no, you're on your own dime. You know? No. <laughs> Schedule the tour around. <laughs> I said, well, I'll do, do, do you pay for, like, what's the drill? What do you do? Well, you got to sit in the, this room. You can't talk to anybody all day until they call you. Wow. <laughs> other, wow. Except other contestants. I said, what about food? Oh, we have a vending machine. I said, do you have to bring your own, have to bring your own quarters? He said, yep. <laughs> Pack your own lunch. <laughs> and the next thing you know, Vanna White's walking out. <laughs> Vanna came in wearing, wearing, wearing sweats. Yeah, and you know, so said hi to everybody that was there, all the contestants, because they shoot shoot a week's worth of shows in one day, right? Vanna, yeah. you got change for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Can you buy me a Cadbury's bar? <laughs> some... well, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. I love Jeopardy. You know, I'm a big fan of Jeopardy. So, I, and I get it. You're on the road, and you want to just change what you're doing, right? You yeah. know, it just just like I work every day. Me and Alan work. We want to change what we're doing. We do this, right? So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. So that's that's how I ended up on on on, on Wheel of Fortune. But they did ask me. They liked me. It's the same crew does it. The the, the, the contestant pickers. They said, hey, "Were you interested? Maybe you may be going on Jeopardy." Because they liked oh, me wow. a lot. I said no. I said that's <laughs> that's that'd be too embarrassing. That's another level, right? Yeah, that, that <laughs> wouldn't work for me very well. <laughs> then they offered you, "Let's make a deal." <laughs> ah, no. <laughs> That'd be a record company. Uh, um, yeah. Alan, do you have anything else on Allied no, Forces? No, hey, uh, you know what? The closer on Allied Forces is a Say Goodbye. One of my favorite songs, a deep track. And I think it's, I just, I don't know. I connect with that song when it came out. And it's still one of my favorites today. And the keyboards behind it. That's what really, I was listening again today. And it's kind of, that's, that's, Mike, what really that's Mike doing that. Propulsed. Right, Mike? Yep. You're, doing, you're playing yeah. the keyboards? Yep. Mm. Yeah, that's the, that's the old Hammond B3 organ. That's yeah. what it is. Are you, are you a proficient song, keyboardist? Are you proficient No, no, I, 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 I used to, when I was younger, I was proficient. And then I decided I didn't want to take piano lessons anymore. Well, <laughs> I wanted to go play baseball and football with my friends. Oh, no, <laughs> Instead yeah, of practicing, yeah. I was I was like, um, it counted for a grade for me in school. You know, it was... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, conservatory level, and then with the day I stopped playing piano, I never didn't touch it again. Wow! I forgot everything I ever learned. But you know, I could hack around and be okay. You know, I was. You're I like was, more of a Getty Lee, more of a Getty Lee keyboardist. On a right? scale of one to ten, I was a one or one and a half. That's okay. what I'm <laughs> At the Gills interview, he goes, "I didn't want to be the singer. They just, nobody else wanted to do it, so I decided to be the singer." <laughs> That's pretty much it. I mean, unless Mike, do you have something else that you want to promote? I'll promote anything. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't think so. I think I think we've covered all all yeah. the uh, the yeah. triumph happenings pretty well. 
what's yeah, going yeah. I mean, on there. Again, you know, we'll uh, touch base again with the band and you and everybody else. And as things progress and new releases and new new information, Allied Forces going to be released, the reissue, on June the 12th. And, and you are the Canadian ambassadors. Right. And, and it's not a reissue, right? This is like a box. This is the first box set we've ever done. We'll wow. call it a box set. There you go. A box yeah. set. Yeah, it's a reissue. But, that doesn't matter. That's just the same album in a different, different world. Ah, world. there's the difference. This is yes. far from the same packaging. That's for oh, sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Daniel. I've already I've I've placed my phone call to my local record store and I've asked them if they're going to get a copy. So it's already yeah, done. That's that's the idea. Yeah. By the way, uh, that, that's a, a good point because there's a limited amount of copies. There's you know there's a limited edition basically. So anybody that need, need, is dying to have it. You do what Al did and phone your local record store and say, hey, you know, I, I have a buyer, you know, make sure you get some stock. Yeah. yeah. Make those yeah. calls early because it's coming but, fast. So. Yeah. What about this I, Canadian ambassadorship? I want to know more about this Canadian ambassadorship. Oh, ambassadorship. Yeah, that's where we get to wear funny hats and walk around with, <laughs> <laughs> with those things and found them on the sidewalk and wear robes and all that. Now, they, they're, every year they pick an ambassador. Uh, basically, to uh, go, you know, to talk to the media, I guess, more than anything, and uh, uh, and, and, pr and promote the record store day, which is a great thing. And it's all about vinyl, really. You know, it's like it's amazing. Like I had no idea how big this was. Oh. There's like 500 stores in Canada, indie, little mom and pop independent store, record stores that are in business. There's like, I I I don't know how many in America, but the list is like unbelievable of, of how many stores there actually are you know which is great so people you know can go in and experiment and find like uh, going to sam the record man now and finding yeah, it out right. and, uh you know i grew up doing that yeah we all did every every friday night that's where we were i was saturday and sunday you know i think i, I bought this at sam the record man i yeah. bought this at sam the record man i'm pretty sure yeah, yeah. So it's uh, you know it's it's great. I think Record Store Day is a is a great thing. It's a great thing. People, there's tons of neat products available too. You know when you, you go to the Record Store Day Canada website, you'll find what they've got that's available. Yeah. That's going to be available in America. The list is like I couldn't even get through. I by the time I got through the A's, I had a headache. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple stuff yeah. out. Very I simple mean, website to use. Just put in your your location and it'll. Pull up. Yeah. I, I think I had about thirty uh, different stores, some that didn't even know existed. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. That's right. You put in your zip code or your area yeah. code, and it's like it'll give you all the stores in the uh, that are close by you. So, so it's 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 pretty I, fabulous. Actually I, I, actually, I have a last question. Are there any rarities like unreleased material? Triumph is sort of sitting like Andy Curran. He was actually as he was digging <laughs> through the attic. He goes, "Wait a second! I found this tape from 1982." Did you you must have talked to Andy about that, right? You, did you sly devil? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. You could ask oh, him. I don't lie Andy, just, Andy just told me that he was working on this box set. Now, okay. if, 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 if that's all he said to me, and I'm I'm completely honest. You could ask him. All right. Well, I'm he, just he asking did, this. He did under some stuff we didn't know he had. So okay. Um, it's uh, it's right. a lot of it's live. A lot of it's really good. You know, which is like like pretty darn hot and, and heavy. So to look forward to something coming out that way oh, okay, um, great, and, great. over the next couple of years. I mean, this box set is enough for now. I don't want to have to put out any more product for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the fans I, I, I are think... hungry for it. Again, yeah. one of my favorite bands of all times. And I Same. think I speak for many, Mike, uh, where we, we, that's probably why the, Jimmy asked the question, you ever get back because we're always looking to see our faves uh, on stage and, uh, it was just to want to thank you for the great years of music. It was a big part of my growing up, and uh, I'm glad to have the, the third member of Triumph here on the Metal Voice finally. So I'll give you my address, and you can send me a check, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. It's, it's great speaking with you. Thanks yeah. for your support. Stay well. And your, and your kind, kind words. Thank you so much so for we'll being on. Simply say, we'll talk say goodbye. That's all. Say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> all right. Have a good one. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thanks.